Penny Pearson from OTAN, meeting learner needs with OER. Thank you, Melinda, and welcome, everyone. I'm going to hide this first little pod here, so um, I have a couple of polls that I'd like you to take. There's two of them here. Um, one of them is just to get an idea of why you're here. Uh, what do you want to get out of this? So please click in that little box where it says type your answer here and type your answer. Um, I am not going to broadcast the results, so you can say whatever you like. And um, then the other poll is simply kind of a rating um, so I can get an idea of what you currently think about open educational resources. And it will help me to gauge how um, I, I move through some of these items that we're going to talk about today. So we'll give a couple of minutes, um, just a couple. So please um, take a moment to answer those questions. Um, for those of you that are just joining us, as Melinda mentioned earlier, I do like the interaction. I rely on it within a webinar like this. If you have done an Adobe Connect webinar before, and you have gone through and know how to set up your audio under Meeting, Audio Setup Wizard. Um, you are welcome to use audio, but I will tell you that if we get open microphones, I will mute everyone. Um, there's nothing worse than listening to sirens going by or dogs barking or, <clears throat> as has happened in the past, even toilets flushing. So. We don't want to have to do that. <laughs> so um, I'm seeing some of the um, um, answers coming in. Uh, it's looking good. Thank you. Uh, as you fill those out, when we continue on, um, I have um, materials for you. As After you've answered those two questions in the lower left-hand corner of this screen, there is a box. We call it a pod. It's called Resources, PowerPoint and a Handout. So I have both of the docu two documents there for you. One of them is a copy of this presentation that I'll be going through. You are more than welcome to take it and download it and use it. Um, we'll talk about why I'm letting you use it as we continue today. When you select the name of the file in the pod, you need to then click the button that says Download Files. Now, depending upon your browser, you may get a pop-up box saying, are you sure you want to download this? You may get a tab that says download the file. So look around your computer. It may appear behind this window. So you might want to resize this and kind of look behind to see if those download files have come up behind this window. The same is true for the handout resources for OER. That is both an outline and a resource uh, list with links and a bibliography to help you um, in this journey of looking at open educational resources and meant to give you some ideas of how you may want to proceed. Um, as I'm looking at our attendance list here, I'm seeing we have a really good variety of folks uh, from all different types of organizations or agencies and sites and also different positions. So I think um, we can have a really good conversation about open educational resources and what they are, and we'll go more as to actually what we're going to do here. So we've only got, hmm, could use some more. Some of you haven't answered yet, so I'm going to uh, say again, I want to get the rest of you to answer those two questions, those two little polls that we have there at the top. And if you can't see them, I'm going to wiggle them. So you can, I just moved your cheese. So if you were trying to get in there and, and uh, answer, I just moved them a little bit. So please uh, fill those out. Looks like everybody can hear me OK. That's great. I do have um, support here, so if there are problems, uh, for some reason, all of a sudden, my voice disappears. Uh, just chat that in the chat pod, and we might be able to uh, give you some help via the chat pod. Ah, so let me see here. We've got some good stuff in the comments. Thank you. I'm still missing about eight of you. So if you can, fill it out. And we have other folks coming in. So as new folks come in, um, we'll see if we can Maybe put these pods off to the side or something. I don't know. Melinda, we'll see what we can figure out here. And again, just as a reminder for new folks that have joined us, there is a resources pod in the lower left-hand corner. You can use that to download a copy of my presentation today, as well as a handout with additional resources that you might find useful. So I'm going to give it one more minute. 
And hopefully that will give folks that are um, you know, trying to grab that brown bag lunch and get back to their computer to join us to come in and log in and then um, get, we can then get started into the, the really good stuff. I like what I'm seeing in these little notes here. Maybe later in the uh, presentation I'll, uh, I'll bring these up and broadcast the results so we can, you can tell me if we met all the goals here. I think we're doing okay. All right, so let's do um, just one more minute. Things are kind of slowing down a little bit. I'm also watching to see if other people are coming in, so I think we're doing all right here. All right, so I'm going to change the screen. So um, as we go through the session today, um, don't be alarmed because I use some different tools where I push content to you. So your computer may all of a sudden be opening up web pages and you're thinking somebody has invaded your computer. It's not. It's just me. <laughs> so I'm going to share my screen here. I'm going to move around the screen a little bit so the polls are going to disappear. Don't worry about that. We'll come back to that if you can at the end. Hold on. And I'm going to, you should see a star stream there right now. And I'll share my screen. And hold on here because you're probably not seeing anything right now, so just hang on a second. Hopefully you're seeing my presentation now. Everybody see that all right? I'll resize this so it fits. Okay, looks like we're good. So let me introduce myself. I know Melinda did that earlier, but my name is Penny Pearson, and I'm a coordinator for distance learning projects with the Outreach and Technical Assistance Network. We are a statewide um, leadership project to help the adult education field, and we provide technical support to school sites, agencies on a variety of topics, including educational technology, as well as um, uh, uh, electronic collaboration, and also with helping with finding curriculum and materials for online and distance learning. So my information is there on the screen. Again, if you download the file from the download pod, or excuse me, the resource pod in the lower left-hand corner, um, you can then see um, and have this information at hand. You'll notice on the screen um, I have a quote there. I don't know if you were a fan of Star Trek, but I'm kind of a, um, oh, I see. Thank you, Melinda. We can move that. Let me move this out of the way, sorry, so that our staff can do attendance off of the participants list. Um, I'm a fan of Leonard Nimoy, and I happened to find this quote from him, and I thought it was perfect for this type of presentation. So um, if you're unfamiliar with, with OTAN, you'll learn a little more about us as we continue. But we have been around for um, over 25 years. We celebrated our 25th anniversary in 2014. So let's move on here. We're, this is what we're going to be talking about today. So I really want to give you an idea of defining open educational resources. You're going to see me write it as OER all the time just because it's shorter. Uh, we'll talk about licensing and finding them, what some of the cost benefits are, and then we hope to have a discussion at the end about potential implementation strategies of how you might be able to use these, whether you're administrator, coordinator, teacher on special assignment, or an in the classroom, on the ground, in the field teacher that is looking for additional resources. So as we move along here, please do not hesitate to um, put information or questions in the chat pod. Um, I, I am monitoring that so I can see what's going on. And yes, live long and prosper. Thank you, Sarah. I think that's a great idea. <laughs> so, so this is one definition. This is a little dated. Um, it comes from the National Education Technology Plan of 2010. Now, I make that distinction because the current technology plan, which you can find at that same URL that's listed on this slide, has no mention of open educational resources. Um, it's pretty much assumed that everybody would take advantage of using these types of resources. So as you read this definition, if you have any questions, something you're going like, what does that mean, put it in the chat pod. This is typically um, the most common um, a definition for open educational resources in K-12. Um, that doesn't mean there aren't others, which I'll share with you here in just a moment. Um, I added the bold because this is typically where I get questions. Materials that reside in the public domain. Okay, what's public domain? 
or have been released under an intellectual property license. What is an intellectual property license? And then that permits sharing and accessing and repurposing um, with others. So when I say something like intellectual property license, what does that mean in your head? Just chat it in the, type pod, in the chat pod. What does that mean? Intellectual property. What are some things that we consider when we talk about intellectual property? I see some folks are typing, so I'll give them a second. Someone created it, patented by someone. Shelby and Sony, you're both on the right track because intellectual property does mean something that I have created. And Maria, you're hitting on it too, copyright protected. There are protections that say, what I create is mine, okay? So let's go on to the next definition. Um, it really is, um, whoops, went the wrong way, sorry. The little wheel on my mouse. So this is another common definition, and this comes out of the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation because they are um, really great supporters and philanthropists when it comes to um, using and creating and sharing and distributing um, uh, open educational resources. So does it sound too different from the previous one? About the same? Only a couple of words different. And you will find as you go along this journey of looking at open educational resources that different countries have slightly different um, definitions and variations. And that basically comes from the fact that each of these countries have different laws or different ways that they protect or do not protect intellectual property. So um, it's something that you know we as individuals, as creators, as teachers, even as administrators, we need to be very aware of Okay, we don't take other people's stuff without permission. So this is why Open Educational Resources has a great deal of flexibility that allows us to do many, many things, but we have to first define what they are. So I'm going to ask a question here. If you find something on the internet, is it free? Just give me a yes or a no or a Y or an N in the chat pod. When you find something on the internet, is it free? I got a yes, I got a no. Don't worry, I'm not going to chastise you for it. I just want to see how, how when you go to the internet, because there's varying degrees of answers to this, I think. Only if it's marked open source, Stephen, yeah. As long as we're using it for class purpose, eh? no, Maria, got to be careful, but yeah. Not all the time. Depends. Kathy, that's my favorite word. Well, it depends. Yes. Any others? Hopefully, by the time we end this session, you'll have a little better idea of why I asked this question. Ah, our, our wet zone is free to read, but not necessarily to distribute. And all of your answers are correct and on the mark. I will say, this is the way I will answer this. The short answer is no. The longer answer is it depends. And I know there's only a one word difference, but there are differing circumstances surrounding many things. So what we're really going to look for is, um, you know, kind of that attitude, well, I don't know if it's an attitude, it's a saying. You know, maybe your mom or your grandma used to say, oh, if it's too good to be true, it probably is. So we need to be cautious about really cool stuff that we find on the internet because it is more than likely protected in some way because it's somebody's intellectual property. Somebody created it. So we have to be aware that we still want to protect that work of those creative minds because it is protected by law. But don't assume that because you find something on the internet that is marked as free, there's different definitions of free as well. So let's look at what is an open educational resource, or OER, what form can it take? So when we go out to the internet, I don't know what you do, but boy, I like to listen to audio, I listen to podcasts, I play some games, I use different applications, I may look for documents, I may watch little videos. All of those types of objects can be licensed 
as an open educational resource. So it's not just these images that you see here representing these different things, but it can be um, textbooks. It can be entire courses that you could load up on your website or your learning management system. And they are licensed as usable by you to provide additional learning materials for your students. But I will tell you this, and I'm going to keep repeating this over and over and over again. You always must check the license of anything you wish to use that comes off of the internet. And we'll go through some ways that you can do that. So, whoops, I went backwards again. See, I have that little rolly bar on my mouse is just making me go backwards. So we're going to talk about public domain versus what's called typically an open license. Public domain is your friend. If you can find materials that have been licensed in the public domain, that is the best that you can do. Because all the copyrights, all of that law protecting the copyright and the intellectual work has been waived by the owner. The owner says, nah, I don't care what you do with this picture of my polar bear. I waive any rights. The public can use it in any way. You can redistribute it. You can color that polar bear pink. Doesn't matter. You can do whatever you want. That's public domain. And there's lots and lots of places on the World Wide Web where you can find all of those same objects that we were looking at before, the podcasts, the images, the lesson plans, all that kind of stuff that has been licensed in the public domain. Now, there's a different license. It's an open license. This means that the creator has retained their copyright ownership. I created it. It's mine. Okay? I am protected by copyright law. However, as the author of that, I can say to you as a user, well, here's how you can use it. You can do X, Y, and Z. Well, that sounds pretty cool. But you as a user have to know what does that look like. And you have to understand there's a definition, basically, of what is an open license. And this comes from the work of David Wiley and the Lumen, Lumen Learning folks and a whole bunch of others. But it talks about what are called the five R's of open. And I do want to make something clear. And this is because of um, Stephen's comment about open source. There are different licenses on objects like those lesson plans, those images, those um, videos, versus software. So we're only talking about the content that we normally as creators would create. I'm not talking about what programmers create. So Stephen, if you're a programmer, that's probably why you came up with that, right? <laughs> and that's just because there is a difference. Um, we're going to stick with the fact that I'm going to be looking for lesson plans, or I'm going to be looking for videos, or I'm going to look for other learning materials that can help my adult learners. So I want to try to find open licenses that adhere to the five R's of open. And they're very simple and straightforward. The right to retain it. So you can make it, you own it, you control the copies of it. So I can put it where I want to put it. I can manage it. I can do all that stuff. I can reuse it. I can put it in different things. I can put it on websites. I can print it out. I can give it to a study group. I can put it in a video. I can use it over and over again. I have the right to change it, to revise it. So I can adjust it. I can modify it. I can change the content itself. Um, for some of us in adult learning especially, we may take a, um, let's say, um, a reading assignment. <clears throat> and we know that as part of that reading assignment, we need to develop a good vocabulary list. So we'll take words out of that, con out of that document, or we'll add material to it, like a vocabulary list. Or maybe we'll translate it. Or we'll put it, um, if it's photos or images, it's like that polar bear uh, reference I used before. I'll take that image and I'll make that polar bear pink instead of white. So I can revise it. I also have the right to remix it. I can combine that original with something else. So if I want to use a lesson plan that's talking about Arctic um, uh, troubles or global warming, and I'm talking about polar bears, and I want this polar bear to stand out on that white ice, I'm going to turn him pink. So I can add and remix materials together. So think of it like a mashup or a smash up or whatever. And then with that, I can share copies of those materials, of that original content, my revisions, my remixes with anybody else. So I can give a copy to a friend. 
So the five R's are important to remember because they are the kind of the epitome, the top of the pinnacle of open resources. They are adhering to these five things. Now I will tell you that there are different levels of open that we'll talk about. But for now, I want you to think about this and tell me if you have any questions. It's in the chat pod. Time for you guys to start talking to me. So what do you think about the definition of open educational resources and the five R's? Any questions about either of those? Thank you, Maria. Sarah's all good? OK. Okie dokie. This is always hard. You have to kind of picture where I'm at. I'm sitting in a room. I have computer screens in front of me, and I can't see a single one of your faces. So the only interaction I get from you is what you put in that chat pod. All right, looks like we're doing OK. So um, just so you know, this particular image that I have on this screen, you'll notice at the bottom of it that I have a little caption there. This is from actually a commercial subscription service. Even though they own the copyright to this image itself, I am allowed under their terms of use to use it in my presentations and share it with you. So just want you to know that I'm not breaking any rules by using this image. So now we've talked about intellectual property. We've talked about public domain. We've talked about open licenses. We talked about the five R's of open. So how the devil do you figure out what's open? It comes down to one simple thing, that thing called licensing. Creative Commons okay, is an organization that started, uh, golly gee, I think it's over 17 years ago now. And basically, they were trying to figure out a way that we as creators could tell users, OK, this is my copyrighted material, but I give you certain permissions of how you can use it. Well, there wasn't anything. The Copyright Office said, well, we don't have anything like that. Get creative. So they did. And they came up with this way of licensing the materials. So I want you to understand, this license is still a copyright license. They simply define and provide detail of how someone else can use your work. Now, this is a two-way street. You as a creator, you can determine how you want to license your work. And as a user or someone who's trying to find materials, this is a way you know exactly how the creator is allowing you to use their work. Now, it's important to note on this little triangle on the left-hand side here, it's talking about most open and then least open. Now, remember, openness is defined by the five R's. So when we look at these licenses, and we're going to go look at some more here in terms of what these license icons look like, you'll see things that look like this at the bottom of a page, on a website, on a lesson plan, in a course. Um, it might be you know, from um, um, a particular website where they have a database of all kinds of goodies, and it will tell you what the licenses are. So you'll see these, the CC. OK, remember the big copyright is a C, single C in a circle? Well, Creative Commons chose CC for Creative Commons. BY means a certain thing. SA means a certain thing. NC means a certain thing. Each one defines how someone can use that work when they take it. So these are the icons. This gives a more, more of an explanation of each one. So you'll notice I uh, uh, enclosed two of them in green. These are considered the most open. Okay? Now, I want, I want you to think about this. Even if something is, has a restriction on it, like, oh, you can't make derivative works, meaning you can't alter it. You can't change the polar bear to pink. You can't translate the work into another language. Does that mean you can't use it? This requires an answer. So head to the chat pod. Because I will bet each of you a nickel that you probably see and or use these materials all the time. You may not be aware of the license because you haven't really noticed these icons. Or you haven't really explored how you could use them. 
And we won't get into a huge discussion about the differences of using materials in an online environment versus using them within the four walls of a classroom. There are differences, and that has an attribution to fair use. And we get fair use that came about because copyright was really meant to be something that said, yes, share this, use it, make derivative works. But then we got some other folks involved that kind of muddied the water a bit. No, Maria, you're, you're actually, it's all about how the user said can, how you can use that work. So if you read some of these, so you'll see here that they've got the little check mark in a circle that says attribution. Can someone use my work to make money? Mm, yeah, which usually freaks everybody out. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What do you mean they can use it to make money? Well, they can. Think about my pink polar bear. If um, somebody was trying to do some type of work on, you know, the effects of global warming or whatever, and they found my image, and I had licensed it this way, they could use it, and they could put it into a book, and they could sell that book. Now, would they ask permission and tell me what they were doing? Probably. But they don't have to, because I, as the creator, made the choice to license it this way. That's an individual creator. The other license here is this attribution share, share alike. Can someone use it to make money? Yeah. Can someone change my work? Yep. But they also have to license it to share it with everybody else. Remember Leonard Nimoy saying, the miracle is this, the more that we share, the more we have? Sharing is a good thing. But we all have to make that decision of how our works can be used. And when you go out and look for materials, you have to see this and understand how is that particular creator allowing you to use it. Most of us in education, we're not doing any of the commercial stuff. So that's not so much of an issue. However, um, there are other folks that create some really good things. And I'll use an example like videos. Um, how many of you watch TED Talks? You like TED Talks? Yeah, love it. Love them. They're wonderful. TED Talks use the last license on the, on the well, actually, sorry, that's not true. It uses the top right license, attribution, non-derivative non works, and no commercial use. But does that mean I can't use it? No, I can use it. I just can't edit it. I can't chop it up into little pieces. I can't change the language on it. I can't sell it. But I can certainly use it. And if you go for TED Talk Education, they actually let you chop it up into little pieces. They have a different license. So it allows for a great deal of flexibility, especially for educators. But we have to be very considerate of how do we actually license our own work and how do we review materials that are licensed by others? Does this, does this make sense so far? Do we have any questions? And Maria, we're going to get to your little comment here in just a moment. Um, Sarah, it's not a registration. In the old days, way before they changed the laws of copyright, you had to register a work as copyright. You no longer have to do it. By the very virtue of you jotting it down on a napkin or taking a photo or you know singing a song, um, you are the owner of that material. You have the intellectual property. It's yours. And it is um, licensed and, and protected by copyright. So no, you do not have to register it. How do we know if it's licensed? Well, Sony, we're going to go over that in just a few minutes, because we're going to start looking for these types of icons. And we're getting more and more of them as we move through the world of the internet, which is a good thing. Any other questions? Now, this goes to um, Maria's comments, about because when I asked before about if you could use something, and she said, oh, I don't think so, unless it's funded by public funds. Well, guess what? There is new rules coming out. Starting in this year, resources created with discretionary competitive grants, and that comes from the Department of Education, they must be openly licensed and shared with the public. Whoa. Think about that. 
Think about all of the companies and organizations out there that get a grant from the federal U.S. Department of Education. Now whatever they create from that has to have an open license. Do you think we're going to get more stuff available for us to use in education? Yes. Yes, we are. Now, I'm going to see if I can open up this link here so I can show you the article. Let's see if it pops up. Here we go. So this is from Creative Commons. This is the outfit that actually created those icons and created the licensing structure that I just showed you a moment ago. So this was just posted um, last year. And it's just in coming into effect, effect in this year. So they're calling. You can see here as I'm scrolling down. Hopefully it's not too fast. Maybe I need to make that a little bigger. Would that help? How's that? A little bit bigger. So this is starting in F fiscal year 2018, and this talks about the grants. Now, for some of uh, some of you in the audience right now, some of you may receive federal WIOA funding. I do not know how that impacts us, those WIOA-funded agencies. But believe me, I'm looking into it. So you can see here down the article, here's some key points. I'm just going to run this down real quick. So this has, a, this has an impact because actually Department of Education is following what Department of Labor did. Now, Department of Labor makes incredible amounts of content. They do online courses. They do things like for HVAC. They do things for electronics and electricians and journeyman programs. All of those materials created under the Department of Labor are all licensed under an open license. Now, there may be some that have some restrictions because of uh, certain waivers that they've sought. But the, the vast majority of them are openly licensed. So it talks here about the license must contain a symbol or device that readily communicates users the permissions granted using the copyrighted work. They have to um, have a plan to disseminate those works, so like a website where you can download them or something like that. So they have some things that the rule does not apply to. And some of you may fall into that, some of you may not. And so as you go along, there's also links in this document that will allow you to um, read the actual Federal Register, which I think is pretty cool. Let me see if I can bring up my presentation again without causing any trouble. Let's see. There we go. So that is very good news. So um, any comments or questions up to this point? I don't think so. It seems like we've been getting good stuff. So I'm going to do something next while this is up. And I don't want you to freak out because it's a little weird. I am going to bring over and push to you some websites. So how this works is at my end, I'm going to send the URL to your computer. And it will open up this web page either in a tab in the current browser that you're in or maybe in your default browser if you're not using your regular browser. It may be behind this page. So just be aware that this is coming. The first one is an OER guide. And it's going to come up on my page. And I'll have to switch around. But you can see it may, you know, you'll be able to see this opening up on your computer. This is a really nice roundup that comes out of Edutopia. And it has some great um, tutorials here about getting started with OERs, how to find them, how to license them, um, where there's some open alternatives to textbooks and other resources on the web. This is really well done. It's a couple of years old, but it's very, very valuable. OK, so I'm going to switch back to my presentation here. And we'll move on. So the next thing is, where can we actually find these things? Because that's what we want. We want to be able to um, look for and find these materials. So we're going to look at four options here. One of them is called the OER repositories. Now, that, art, that page that I just pushed to you, and if you didn't get it or whatever, tell me in the chat pod. But know that when you download the um, PowerPoint presentation, all the links are there. So Teresa, if it didn't open up for you, don't worry. If you download the, um, the presentation that's in the resources pod, you'll have that link. So when you open up your PowerPoint presentation, um, it'll, you can just click on it, and it'll take you right to it. OER repositories are just kind of what they sound like. They are collections of stuff. 
Um, there's all kinds of repositories out there. Some of them are by universities. Some of them are by um, other educational organizations like, like uh, community colleges. Um, they're done by organizations that have live human beings that curate and watch, these material, watch for these materials and provide ways to evaluate them, rate them, and download them, and track people who use your materials. So we'll look at some OER repositories, and I'm going to show you some samples that come from those repositories. And we'll talk about searching for them. And I'm using Google just as an example. Um, I use Google all the time. But if you use a different search engine, you should be able to do the same types of searching. We'll also go out and look at the Creative Commons website, because they have a very nice landing page where you can start a search for um, different types of resources, whether they're images, music, podcasts, etc. And believe it or not, you can also find Creative Commons licensed materials on YouTube. Um, that is a decision made by the video creator, where they allow you to take those videos and chop them up into little pieces and remix them with something else. So let's take a look at what some of these may look like. Um, some sample textbooks. Now, um, on this page here, I'm going to open up some of these because you can't click on these links on the screen. So again, um, for people like Teresa, if you did not get this, if it didn't, you know, look in your taskbar or in your doc if you're on a Mac to see if it opened up in another browser, and that um, OER guide. So I'm going to open up Open Washington. Washington is really at the forefront with um, using open educational resources and implement that, implementing them at all different levels. This, is, this page here is Open Washington. This is called Module 1. There's 10 modules here about how to use open educational resources. You see it on your screen. And again, if it did not open for you, that's OK. It's in the PowerPoint. But this is a great way for you or your staff or your coordinators or anybody who really wants to kind of dig in to using open educational resources. This is one of many um, great um, resources. Now, there was another where you know the Adult education field has been a little slower getting to the table on creating and using open educational resources. But there is one person, I'm not going to play this, I'm just going to show you what the page looks like, who is, um, oops, all right, I got the wrong link here. Hold on. Let me see if I can open this up here. There we go. This woman here is um, up out of Washington, and she is at Everett Community College, and she's a, a basic adult basic education department um, instructor. And she tells a story. This video is about seven minutes long, so don't get sidetracked. Watch it later. About how she uses open educational resources uh, with her adult education, adult basic education um, learners. So you can get a feel for how an instructor, and I, I guarantee you, she started this was like, I didn't even like know they existed. And here I had to go in and, wow, I found all this really cool stuff. So it's a nice. Um, overview of how a teacher can use um, open education resources within a, the adult education field for adult literacy. Now, she used open educational resources, but she didn't really tell us what she used. So I want to show you some other resources that you might find useful for your learners. And one of them here is also from BC Campus. And this is um, a textbook on adult literacy fundamentals in mathematics. <clears throat> Any of you guys teach mathematics at your site? So if you look at this, um, this is a six book series on fundamental mathematics for adult learners. They've got practice tests, they've got grades, books, and everything. Now, you can use this site, and you can go in and find um, ways to download. And remember, I believe it was, I probably don't have the right name here. There was a question about how do we know if it's licensed? Here we go. It's right here. And what's nice about, because we're starting to recognize these icons, is that if I'm not sure what this means, all of our what we call attribution of how we license a work should tell me what type of license it is. So I'm going to open this up, this link. And it should open me to the Creative Commons um, website, and it tells me exactly what I can do. Okay? I can copy and redistribute the material in any medium or format. I can remix it, transform it, and build upon it for any purpose, even commercially. Okay? 
And it gives me the following terms. I have to give proper credit. Well, isn't that just good manners to give someone credit? Okay? And if you made changes, then you should indicate it. So I'm going to go back to my polar bear. My original image was of a white polar bear. And um, Susie Photographer did that. Well, if I um, take that image and I want to use it and I turn it pink, sorry, this is a, also a nonprofit site, so they ask for donations, I'll tell you right up front. Um, I take that and turn that polar bear pink. I would have to, by this license, say, well, Sally Photographer um, did, uh, gave this or licensed this as CC BY with um, an adaptation to color the polar bear pink by Penny Pearson. Something very short that tells somebody how the image was changed. But this all comes out of um, that textbook, remember? And I can download this as a PDF. I can look at it as the instructor resources on a website. I can download it as a Word file, which is very nice, because most of us have Word or something that can edit Word, right? That's all part of that five R's. Does anybody remember what those five R's are? That's a quiz, right? Because openness means that I can change it. And if you put it in a format where I can't do that, like PDF, um, I can't edit a PDF very, very easily unless I pay a, a, a big sum of money for a PDF editor. Um, some of that is, you know, different in different countries where, you know, PDFs are the norm because people don't change them. And that's okay. That's the way this is licensed. I can use it in any number of ways. So do you think this type of textbook might be useful for your learners? They don't cost anything unless you want to buy a print version of it. I can buy a print copy. But I don't have to. I can just download it and distribute it to my learners. So we did math. And so they also have um, fundamental English course. So same principle. Here's nine stories about healing, discovery, survival, relationship, justice, and connections to the land. And it goes through and it tells you what it's about. And again, you have support, you have the author, you have course packs, you have PDFs. You can even download it in an e-reader, EPUB, or a Kindle copy. So that could be really cool if you have learners that have smartphones or tablets, right? No cost. OK, so let me go back to another one. Because some of us in adult education are really looking at expanding our career tech ed offerings and doing different things like apprenticeships or something that helps our learners um, go out and actually make a livable wage. Now, sometimes I get the question, well, this is all from, you know, from British Columbia. They probably have different laws or different stuff. Yeah, they might. But because of the way it's licensed, could you change it? Could you update it? Could it reflect your local situation? Yeah, because they give you the license to change it. And again, same thing. You can read the book online. They give you resources to help you teach this. They give you PowerPoint slides. You can do a PDF, an e-reader, a Kindle. You can get all these different versions of it and change it. Can you show us the legal verbiage for editing an OER document or picture? There is a link that is in your resource page, that handout resources. Um, and on the OER Commons website, I will try to find you about what's called proper attribution. Okay, That's what it's talking about. And I'm going to show you a slide here in a minute about what that means. Um, and, I'll, and I'll show you some, I'll go back and show you some examples. It's really straightforward and simple. But it's, it's kind of like just following some rules. Remember when you were in college and you had to do a bibliography in MLA or APA style? Similar. It's just saying you need to have certain parts um, showing how a particular work is licensed. Okay? It's not complex. Don't be afraid. <laughs> okay? So let's go back here again to my presentation so we can move forward here. Um, CK12 at the bottom is just a, another website that has a whole bunch of free textbooks. Um, this one happens to be for um, middle school math. But what's really unique and wonderful about CK12 is that these, they call them flex books. You can see that link over here on the left-hand side. 
um, where you can pick pieces from different books and build your own flex book. And again, it doesn't cost you anything. You can customize things. You can download it. And you can also, they have some apps where you can, um, your learners anyway, and you, can look at this material. Um, this is a free site, as is um, BC Campus, Open Campus. You create an account and then start exploring and seeing what you can um, do and what you can learn. And there's great, you know, they have groups that work together. Uh, and you you can find additional help rather than just trying to um, you know find stuff on your own. There's other resources and support and uh, tutorials. That's what I was trying to say. So from here, we're going to move on here to uh, looking at another site that is a large repository and one of my favorites because I happen to work on several projects that are reflected here. The first one is a California Community College site called Cool for Ed. Now I'm going to open it for you so you can see it. Um, but this is an open library for that started from the uh, community colleges. Um, and this, again, is a um, partnership with um, the community college, the, the Cal State, as well as the University of California. And when you come into this site, you can see where they've got lots of materials in terms of finding materials, textbooks, course materials, online courses, um, looking for showcases of how others have used it. Um, they have a collection of other OER resources when you want to look at, OK, I'm, I need to do a, a whole course or a lesson, or, or I'm teaching a class for a few weeks. Um, they also, very importantly, look for um, accessibility issues. We may have folks that create some really good stuff, but they don't always follow um, good accessibility guidelines. So this is something where you can come in and search um, and find materials. Um, and I guarantee you, you'll find something, but you do have to have patience. You need to spend some time exploring these. And believe me, guys, I have hundreds of these. So this is just another potential resource. And the last one I'm going to show you is back to this OER Commons. This is by far my favorite. The reason why it is my favorite is because it is curated. The materials on this site are curated by humans, which means somebody looks at them. They put them in categories. You can not only find materials here, but you can find them based on keyword search, subject area, standard, and grade level, including adult education. Not very many repositories carve out adult education as a category. Now, also within OER Commons is what they call groups. Anyone can join a group. Anyone can add um, resources or open educational resources to these groups. And the three that are listed on here are meant to be, they're very specific for adult learners. So the first one, Adult Education Open Community of Resources, there's over 200 adult educators that are in this group. And they are educators from all over the country. And they have reviewed, and they've evaluated, and they provide comments, because they take the OERs that are in this group, and they've tried them in a classroom. So Adult Learning Zone, this is a really great place to kind of look at how do people use good instructional design to create open educational resources. So these are actually designers that are looking to create OER. Um, and it, so it's a little different feel. It's they're Not everything is really ready for learners, but it does provide you with a platform to take a look. And if you like it, you can, of course, use them and modify them yourself. The last one comes from um, uh, the OER STEM Science User Group. This was part of an open educational resource project out of the American Institute for Research, um, yeah, American Institute for Research, AIR, uh, that we call it American Institute for Research. And they were contracted with the Federal um, Office of Adult and Continuing Tech Career and Technical Education, or OCTE for short, to look at and create and review open educational resources. So they had a very fo they had a very clear focus on um, science and math, and many of the um, uh, math OERs are in the adult education open community of resources, and the others are all science based. So let me open this up, and again, this is my favorite place. 
because, um, as I said, here you can search by keyword, by subject, by education level, including adult ed. And you can search by standard. And just so you know, I've been in communication with the parent organization, which is called ISCME. It's uh, the Institute for the Study of Knowledge Management and Education. And they are working to add the college and career readiness standards to this list of standards. So th they're getting better and better about helping the adult education field align their ma open educational materials to the college and career readiness standards. So. Not only can you find and search for materials that way, but you can also build with them. You can create with them using something that they call open author. Um, I'm not going to go much farther into this site. It is some place that you should explore, search. The key things you need to understand is if I was to be looking for um, an item or materials on, say, climate change, I'm only using that as a um, keyword search. Let me zoom in on this a little bit. So when you look at, whoops, let me go back one more so this kind of stays together. When you look at these, you'll see that on the uh, left-hand side here it says conditions for use, remix and share. Notice they didn't say creative commons. So if I scroll down this list, okay, this is all remix and share. <laughs> so you may find some that, um, let me see if I can find one here. Let's say here's the rest of them. So they'll have some no strings attached. Others that are remix and share. Others are share only. Read the fine print. Well, this means that it's co copyrighted material, right? But some of it are available under different conditions. So you'd have to just, as I said, read the fine print. But each one of these allows you to go out, and if you looked for um, at the materials like Cool Core Capture Climate, climate Change, um, I can look at that and I can get an idea of what people think about it. Um, it there may be comments or not. And on the left-hand side, it tells me here, how can I use it? Here again, we're starting to see those icons more and more. This tells me that I have to give attribution. I can't sell it or make money off of it, and I have to share it, anything that I make from it. This is called, the, the um, attribution is called Tassel, title, author, source, and license. So in this case, the title here is this cool, cool cores capture climate change. The author, we may have to look over here, it's Gene Pennycook. Um, it, sometimes that's an organization, that's a person. But all of the correct licensing material is, information is on this page. Title, author, source, and license. So let me go back to my presentation here. Now, I haven't seen any um, questions coming in yet. Are we doing OK? So far, so good. What's our time here? I think I lost my clock. Are we learning something good? OK, I think we're learning something good. So I'm going to skip ahead here to a couple of other items. Um, this is an organization. This is a membership organization. They have a whole series of materials that they've created under grants and licenses. And the materials that they create are licensed under Creative Commons. But it does require a membership. So I'm not going to go in and open them, but O10 is a member of the NROC network. So we have, like on our Moodle server, we provide the NROC math course, the NROC English course. We also have access to EdReady, which is a math um, personalized learning tool. And then Hippocampus is another one that is um, a whole series of all the high school subjects. So if you need science or history or economics, they have all kinds of great resources that are interactive, they're multimedia, and teachers can create playlists in order to get their learners through a particular subject or area. So let's move on here and look at an advanced search with Google. So that's one of, our, like I said, it's one of our favorite, if I can get my mouse over here, one of my favorite um, search engines to use. And under a Google search, you have the option in the advanced settings to change the usage rights. 
Again, it's not using the same exact verbiage of Creative Commons, and that's basically because this is an international search tool, and there's folks from all over the world that are using it. But you can see how those usage rights align with Creative Commons. So free to use or share, doesn't that sound like CC BY, attribution? Free to use or share even commercially. Free to use or share or modify. So each one of these kind of align with those Creative Commons licensing. Now I will tell you this, and I'm going to repeat it over and over again. Anytime you use a Google search or any of these other tools to find materials, you always, always, always check the license. Now that means that you have to find that icon, or you have to go in and you have to look at the terms of use. You have to find that link on the web page that says copyright something, because if it isn't obvious with one of those icons that we were looking at earlier, you, it is up to you to do your due diligence if you plan on taking this work to know exactly how the author intended it to be used. And I'll, I'll tell you, sometimes it's kind of a pain because you can't find it. And you have to do that age-old option, which is to simply ask. And I will tell you that in all of my experience in the last 10 years of working with OER, Anybody that goes in and asks for permission, I've only heard of maybe one person who never got permission, especially if you tell them that you're an educator and what you're using it for. So this is Creative Commons. And when you work in Creative Commons, this is a, a search option page. When you look at the top of the page, you'll see that big green button. And you'll see the square on the right there that says, enter your search query. And then some options of how you want to use your work. And then below that, they have um, a whole kind of checklist or different boxes that you can use that will kind of, sort of align <laughs> to what your search query is. Never rely on it. Okay, it's not a search engine here. This is just a landing page to get uh, really easy access to a lot of different places that offer Creative Commons materials. So it's if you're looking for music that you want to use in creating your YouTube videos, you can search SoundCloud or Jamendo. All of the music that's available there is licensed so you can use it in your own productions. All they ask for is credit. Um, maybe you want some um, images. Well, Flickr is really good. One of my favorites is Pixabay. They have thousands of really high quality images that are almost always under public domain. Public domain is our friend because then you can do anything with those particular images. So um, this is just a place to start. Um, it's just don't ever assume that because you click those little boxes that what you find is actually licensed that way. Does that make sense? Oh, Pixabay, P-I-X-A-B-A-Y. I, I just saw your note, Maria. Pixabay. And there's other ones too, photos for class and photos for, photos for work. Also, um, within um, Creative Commons, they have a new prototype for um, images, especially. And it, this is all beta. And it also allows you to tick off some boxes about how you can um, use those images. And they tell you on there that it says, you know, hey, um, this is just a beta. So let's see what happens, right? And I've used it, and it's, it's good. I've found really great images. They typically come from two or three main sites, Flickr being probably at the top, and Google Images running a close second. So this is under creativecommons.org. The next one is under YouTube. If you ask your students where do they go first to learn something, typically they're not going to tell you it's Google. They're going to tell you it's YouTube. They go here first to learn something. Now, with YouTube, it's a little different in that you have to do a keyword search first. So you'll put it up there like I put playful grizzly bear. And then um, the next step is you have to filter all of those results. So mine shows up here under the YouTube icon on the left. It says I got over 8,000 results. Well, I don't have time for that. So I'm going to drop down the filter, and I can make all of these different changes. When it was uploaded, what type it is, how long it is, which I like to have short and long. It's covered by that little bubble, but it's very 
handy because if you know your learners aren't going to watch something more than five minutes long, you can tell it. Give me something that's less than five minutes long. But the key one there is Creative Commons. Now what that does is that when you have an account with um, YouTube or you know when you sign up for Gmail, it also gives you access to YouTube. You can then copy and remix that work. So I can show you here, uh, there's a little YouTube video that will actually, well, maybe I won't, because it's on a different screen. You'll have to pull it out of the, um, the copy of the PowerPoint, but there's a nice little video that shows you how do you actually um, find using this filter, and then um, uh, upload and edit your Creative Commons licensed YouTube video. So I think that can be really a, a nice thing, especially if you have your learners creating materials. And we'll talk more about that. So now that we've gone through all this stuff, again, I'm going to say it really simple. You always have to check the license. So that may be that if there's an icon there that says it's Creative Commons license, it may be they have to go under terms of use or usage rights or something. If you find something, you need to provide proper attribution. Now, that, that's the little rules that we're talking about the legal verbiage for editing an OER document. Just remember the term TASL, T-A-S-L, title, author, source, and license. Now, when you've done that, my personal practice is I try to um, keep a document of my attributions. So on this particular um, presentation, my attributions are in the notes or they're on the images themselves. So let me give you an example here real quick. We're going to jump back. When we did the, um, the section here on what's an OER, hold on, this one, you'll notice here that under some images I have a little um, link. Like this one is simulations, CC by Idaho National Library. OK, what's the title? simulations. Who's the author? Idaho National Library. What's the license? CC BY. And the source is also happens to be Idaho National Library. If they don't have a credit, and I put it down here, all uncredited images are public domain retrieved from Open Clip Art. And that is a link to Open Clip Art. Now, legally, I am not required to attribute public domain anything. But I think it's good manners, and it also models for you how you can get back and find the same things. So like my little lesson plan image here and my music image here, these came from Open Clip Art, and I did not have to provide a tassel, title, author, source, and license. This one, apps, same thing. This is a link that will take me to Christopher's site where I retrieved this image, and I can read more about his license and how he wants his works to be used. So that's kind of that verbiage, OK? It's remember, title, author, source, and license, because you're now providing the information for someone else who may want to go and find that exact same image. Think about it like that bibliography, remember? You're citing somebody in your research paper. You provide a way for them to get to that information. OK, so now I need to go back to where we were. So I think we're running out of time, aren't we? So I want you to think a minute about what are some of the benefits. And I've got the link here to Jennifer Jennings again from Everett Community College. Again, that's a seven minute video. But I want you to use the, the chat pod. And I want you to tell me what you think some of the benefits could be of adapting um, OER in your programs. What could it be? And I'm going to give you my list. And then I'll listen to your list. Some of you may be in the process of textbook review, <gasps> right? Some of you may be in the process that you have textbooks that are 20 years old. They're tattered. You keep losing them. Some of you may be implementing more of a blended or online um, offering of classes to your learners. And you need content. You need ways to build out materials that your learners can gain from. More resources. Mm -hmm. Jared, I like free. I want, you to, I want you to think about this term for a minute. 
when you think about OER, and sometimes you know this is also with software for open source software because it's free. Think about free this way: free as in puppy, not like free as in beer or Pepsi or Coke. What does that imply? I mean, we can have really cool stuff, but just because we don't pay any money for it up front, it doesn't mean it doesn't have costs associated with it. Okay, so that means there's there's a difference between free as in puppy versus beer, or free as in freedom, freedom to do what you need to do to meet the needs for your learners. Yeah, Maria, I like that digital storytelling. They will learn how to borrow legally other people's work. That is a really, really important lesson that all of us as educators need to be telling our learners. I can tell you a very quick story about one teacher who has her learners that do these really great stories, and they would talk about vacations or whatever, and she was posting it on her website, which was basically one of those free websites that was anybody could get to it, and it was a way for them they could share it with their family and everything, and she got a cease and desist order. Because one of her students had gone out and copied images from a, a source that those images are highly protected. Think about some of the places where you get images from. Oh, this is a great image off of the Disney website. Or, oh, this is a really cool image I found from um, um, Getty Images. Okay, Those are copyright protected. And there are technologies now that allow these little search bots little spidery things that crawl around the web and they go, hey, here's an image of Mickey Mouse. It doesn't belong here. And they send out cease and desist orders. Because you cannot just simply take it because you see it on the internet. Okay? Absolutely. So that's something to think about. So okay, material can be shared with colleagues. Leveraging existing resources to reduce cost and labor. Yes. Um, open experience for adults with disabilities. Lois, you're really on to something there, because a lot of the instructional designers are realizing that with some of these open sourced software programs, they can make some extremely rich um, experiential um, learning objects for uh, lear learners with disabilities. So um, learner empowerment, I saw that in there. When you get learners to create OER, they do amazing things. Um, they're more engaged with the content, they're more engaged with the teacher, and they can produce extremely effective and relevant open educational resources for their peers, which means other adult learners who are in the same situation. So these are things that have been proven in research, by the way, and I have a list of articles in that um, handout resources. And another one, of course, is, as you've mentioned, is cost savings, especially when it comes to textbooks. There are billions of dollars being saved by learners who do not have to pay the exorbitant rates for commercially published materials. So and the list goes on, but it's something for you to, um, to keep in mind. There are ways that you can adopt and then actually get your learners involved as well. well. Um, uh, Maria, you're right. Um, it is something that, because a lot of folks grow up with it, they just think, well, it's all there. I can use it. I can do anything I want with it. Absolutely. So the problem that we then get to is like, OK, we've learned about what are OERs. We've learned about the five R's for that, you know, making sure that they're open or not. We understand the licensing, as we've seen through Creative Commons. Um, wow, this is cool. This is really neat. So how do we actually start using them? So I'd like to talk a little bit about you know, what are some implementation strategies that you may consider. First and foremost, I'm going to tell you, start small. Okay? Identify a need and clearly identify what your goal is. And that can be something as simple as you need a new um, set of textbooks for your low literacy reading program and adult basic education. Okay. That can, that's going to be a, a small piece. And start with identifying that goal and then make that goal smart, a smart goal. Does everybody remember that one? I think that's everywhere. Everybody's talking about smart goals. They are specific. They're measurable. So you're going to tie it to something like learner outcomes, because that's what it's all about, getting these learners where they need to go. 
it's achievable or it's attainable. It's not pie in the sky stuff. You're actually doing something that is, you can do within the time frame you've allotted. And it's very much about results. What is it that you want to see as a result of this SMART goal? And of course, time bound, because we need to get it done. We can't let it go on and on forever. Identify some of your enthusiastic teachers or other coordinators or teacher on special assignment, um, folks that actually are in charge of looking at curriculum. Find your librarians. They are amazing. Okay? And they can help you um, to identify and understand that your goal is, is clearly smart, your goal is achievable, but then they can help you find some of those resources. And then you can set up with these, this group of looking at, well, let's evaluate it. Let's see if it's really going to work for our learners. And look to your other partners. Um, most of you are involved, or all of you are involved, in some type of consortia. You're working with your workforce investment boards to some degree. All of these people have resources available. And I mean resources not only in terms of money, but in people. And people that are willing to help because they're involved with you as, again, learner-oriented, getting these people from point A to point B, earning a livable wage and contributing to our society and our economy. So those are some ideas. What other strategies might you use? Who would you go to in your local consortium or within your local agency or, or school site? How would you start? Do you have something in place already that might say, oh, this would be a good, a good way to, to go. Let's take a peek. Let's, let's look and try to find something. Mm, people are thinking because they're not typing. All right, give it a couple of more seconds here. Some of you may be working on committees that are doing like standards crosswalks, or maybe you're looking to um, uh, replace some materials because they're so out of date. This might be a good place to start to just find that one thing. OK. So I have another set of questions for you. We're almost done. So given what you know right now, put on your um, forecasting cap and think about how do you think open educational resources can impact adult education. I should have labeled these 1, 2, and 3 from left to right because I'd like you to answer the questions in the chat pod because I'd like to see how you think what you've learned today that you can move forward. So how do you think OER can impact adult education? Think about it as at a visionary view from, from high above in the stratosphere. Second question is, what are your next steps of using OER? What are you going to do to tell people about or look at or implement using open educational resources at your sites? And then number three, what value do you see of using OER at your specific agency? And some of you may say, well, you know what, it doesn't really impact us, but boy, I want my teachers to know about it, or I want my librarians to know about it, or it may be that there's another application. Just so you know, not only do we have the federal government looking at at least the Department of Education, the Department of Labor, saying that anything that is created from public funds used by grant grantees, they must be openly licensed. California itself is what's called a go-open state. There has been an embracing, that's the correct word, I'm not sure, of using open educational resources to reducing the cost of textbooks at the community colleges and institutes of higher uh, learning, but also into inst instituting them in the K-12 system because they afford so much richness for the learners when they're properly applied. And that means you know, there's a lot of planning and a forethought going into how are these materials used at the K-12 system. So the Go Open um, movement has been around for a while. If you haven't heard about it, just Google Go Open California. And it's really important that you understand how that, that ties in very tightly with the new federal uh, regulations going into effect, uh, especially those of us that receive public funds as I said, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how that would affect our adult schools that receive, say, the federal grants from WIOA. Um, how does that 
particularly um, uh, affect folks that receive other types of grants where part of what they're doing is to create materials for their learners. Mm, Stephen, thank you. I like that. Create our own in-house resource guide. That would be awesome. The cost savings gene. Mm -hmm. Look at those sites. And I like that. You're revising curriculum, and now you're not bound by physical textbooks. No, you are not. You have amazing opportunities and abilities to share resources digitally. And because it's digital and it's on a website, the costs of that are incrementally much, much lower. So I love seeing these things come in. And I'll pose a question, because um, I work in an area where I work with open educational resources, and I really pound that drum frequently. And I think that it's important for not only an in-class situation where you've got four walls and a teacher, but also an online or distance class to provide relevant materials to our adult learners, not something that has been uh, you know, a third grade reader with what I call kind of the bubblegum and butterflies effect. We need teachers and administrators and the adult education field to create open educational resources for adult learners, for adult literacy learners. What about an adult literacy OER repository? OER Commons has gotten us started because it allows us to identify and tag materials for adult education, but sometimes that wor those words, adult education, get compromised by other words that aren't related to education at all. <laughs> so I, you know, I think adult literacy might be a better term, but that's just my opinion. But what if, what if we had something like a cool for ed in adult education, not just the universities and the community colleges? Would that be a value to our adult education partners within, within the state of California and, quite frankly, across the United States? What do you think? Something that we could do. So let's think about, OK, I've got some of your final thoughts. I'm going to go ahead, and I think I can bring in up those pods. So for those of you that joined us late, oh, maybe not. Hold on, let me go find them here real quick. I want to bring up those polls that I had before. So if you did not have a chance to answer them, I'm just going to put them over here real quick and let you take a look. If you didn't get a chance to answer. You can see what's, um, I am not broadcasting the results. So um, just take that as um, at, at its level. <laughs> I mean, I'm, not, I'm just not broadcasting them. But you can tell me in the chat pod, those of you that started from the beginning, if um, I met your expectations for what you wanted to get out of this session. Because I want to tell you about some options for the future. Um, consider having a, a workshop at your site, talking about in more depth, three-hour workshop on what is OER, how do I search for them, how do I know that it's really an OER, where do I find that licensing, how do I read a terms of use or a copyright or something like that. If you come from a WIOA-funded agency, OTAN can come down and do the types of um, workshops, such as just the basics about OER. I go in and show people how to use the open author tool on Creative Commons, or excuse me, on OER Commons. So I teach your teachers how to create an OER and license it. So those are types of workshops that you can just call me at OTAN, and we can come and do a workshop for you at no cost. Now, if you are with um, AEBG Consortia and you're part of looking at the um, Technical Assistance Project, you can ask them for these workshops, but they're going to have to find um, somebody like me, which is probably me, who knows, um, will come down and um, depending on scheduling and um, instructor availability, we can help you. That's what AEBG TAP, as well as OTAN, is to help the adult education field. So I have, um, I'm all done. I have no additional information. If you have other questions, 
that you um, want me to answer or you want me to show you something on a website, I will show you. I'm happy to be here as long as you need me. <laughs> Stephen, uh, that's cool. I like that. Um, Maria, um, there's some a, a variety of questions that need to be answered first. I'm going to speak to you as a representative of OTAN, Outreach and Technical Assistance Network. We have the um, uh, work with State of California CDE to support those agencies, those adult education agencies that receive WEOA funding. Now, if that's you, that means as OTAN comes to you, we need a minimum of 10 teachers from your site to attend the, an OER training or any other training that we offer. Okay. Now, if you are part of a consortia, then that's a little different process. And Melinda, as well as other staff from um, AEDG's TAP, will be looking and asking you some questions about what kind of event are you working to um, offer. So that may that I can't answer all of those questions because it's a big, you know, like we said about it, stuff on the internet free. It depends. It depends on what kind of event it is. It depends on your agency, and it also depends on instructor availability and time frame. So um, OTAN, we have, if you are WEOA funded, we need 10 instructors. AEBG TAP, you need to talk to them specifically. Um, Lois, if you download from the pod on the left-hand side, I'm going to move these things out of the way because they're bugging me. Hold on here because my, my pod got moved. So right here, I'm going to move this pod so you can see it here. If you click on the Meeting Learner Needs with OER, that's a PowerPoint presentation, you are more than welcome to download that and has all of the goodies there. Because this presentation is licensed under Creative Commons, you are free to take it, modify it, change it, revise it, remix it, mash it up, and show it to your local teachers, learners, administrators, wherever you may need it. OK? So hopefully, Lois, that, that helps you. Just click on the name of the file, Meeting Learner Needs, and then click the button that says Download Files. And the handout, Resources OER for AEDG TAP, has got a whole bunch of um, listings of articles, websites, and other things that some of them and most of them were in the presentation, but there's others including some articles about cost savings and implementation in other areas for um, using open educational resources. Lois, that is what the icons look like. That's one of them. But remember, you may have missed it here earlier. Let me go back. I'll show you all of them. All of them look like this. And each one has a different meaning about how the particular work can be used. So again, if you look at the PowerPoint presentation, you'll, have, you'll see all the explanations of what that looks like. OK. So I think we're at the end of our session here. Let me, I'll just wait just a minute. I said we were going to go till 1.30, and we're almost there. Oh, thank you, Holly. Oh, thanks, Holly. That's right, we've got some folks that are on phones, which is so cool. I think that's great. So what I'm going to do then is I will turn it back over to Melinda so she can talk to you about some of the things that will happen when we close this session. I'm going to type in the chat pod here my contact information uh, in terms of my email address. And again, if it's something that if you are from a, um, a WIOA funded agency and you are looking to maybe um, uh, add or ask us to come and do a workshop, you can call me directly or email me, and we will um, get you started. And so from there, Ms. Melinda, I am all done. Thank you very much. Thank you all for attending. And I hope to see you online again real soon. OK, thank you very much, Penny. Um, I learned a lot today. Woohoo! Thank you very much. Thank you all for attending. And I hope to see you online again real soon.